Hello Biology 400, this is Mr. Workman and uh, this will be your organic chemistry screencast segment 3 on carbohydrates. As you view this screencast, please make sure that you have some paper with you so that you can take good two column notes and uh, write down of course any definitions, any explanations, even diagram uh, and draw some of the figures that you see that you think are going to be important to your understanding of carbohydrates. <clears throat> let's get to it. So let's uh, talk about how you can recognize what a carbohydrate is. Um, first of all, if you look at this word, carbo, that is like carbon. And if you look at hydrate here, it, that looks like hydrogen. Don't confuse these carbohydrates with hydrocarbons. Carbohydrates contain carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Hydrocarbons, on the other hand, contain just carbon and hydrogen. They do not contain any oxygen. So, <coughs> pardon me, if you see a molecule that contains the atoms carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a one to two to one ratio, uh, you're most likely looking at a carbohydrate. So this one to two to one ratio, this one to one refers to carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In other words, there are twice as many hydrogens as there are carbons. There are also twice as many hydrogens as there are oxygens. And the number of carbons and the number of oxygens will be just about equal. The building blocks of carbohydrates, the monomers, the single units that is, are referred to as monosaccharides. And if you link two monosaccharides together, by way of dehydration synthesis or the formation of water, condensation synthesis, you get what we call a disaccharide, and if that process happens over and over again, we get what we call polysaccharides. Monosaccharides are simply referred to as sugars in everyday language, sometimes called simple sugars. Disaccharides can be fairly classified as simple sugars as well, whereas polysaccharides are referred to in the nutritional uh, world as complex carbohydrates or complex sugars. When you look at the formula of any sugar, the general empirical formula is going to be CH2O, and how often that repeats depends on how big of a carbohydrate we're talking about. This is just another way to show that there's going to be twice as many hydrogens as there are carbons. So let's look at this hydrocarbon. Hexane, this word, uh, this prefix on this word hex means six. Can you see here that there are six carbons lined up in a chain and they're surrounded by enough hydrogen. It's fully saturated with hydrogen so that each carbon is making four bonds as required by its tetravalency. In contrast, if you look over here, these chains of six carbons are a little bit more interesting. Do you see why? There's some oxygens. There's a C double bond O here. This one is another chain of six carbons. Here's a C double bond O. And I want to let you know that this diagram is actually inaccurate. This hydrogen should not be here. That hydrogen would indicate that this carbon is making five bonds. So this hydrogen is actually an error in this diagram. Take a look at the difference between these two molecules, glucose and fructose. You can see here that this is called an aldose sugar, and this is called a ketose sugar. <coughs> but if you count up the total number of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens, they have the same number of carbons, they have the same number of hydrogens, and the same number of oxygens. The way that they differ is in how those carbons and hydrogens and oxygens are put together, the way that they're arranged. And you can see here that the C double bond O in glucose is at the end of the chain of carbon, so it's on the last carbon. And as a result, that's an aldehyde, so we call glucose an aldose sugar. You might start to note that many sugars are named with the ending O-S-E. Okay, so glucose, O-S-E, fructose, O-S-E. Fructose is a ketose sugar because its carbonyl, its C double bond O, is not at the end of the chain of carbons, it's somewhere in the middle of the chain of carbons. 
monosaccharides, some characteristics of sugar, are, you know, the fact that they um, have polar bonds in them, polar covalent bonds, if you remember your electronegativity bonding rules. Oxygen bonded to hydrogen is a moderate difference in electronegativity. Uh, C, uh, carbon bonded to oxygen, especially a double bond, uh, that's going to be a polar bond because there's a moderate difference in electronegativity there. There's OH bonds and there's CO bonds all over this molecule, which means because there are lots of polar bonds in this molecule, it'll interact with water, which is a, also a polar molecule. So because sugars will interact with water, they are literally water-loving, they're called hydrophilic because of their polar bonds that they contain. <clears throat> Monosaccharides can be found in six carbon chains, straight chains, or sometimes they can fold back on themselves, as you see here, in the form of rings. Sorry about that. So look at this. Do you notice that this is a roughly a hexagon shape? I want you to make note of that because we're going to see some diagrams. You've already seen some diagrams and you're going to see some more diagrams where not all these carbons are necessarily um, noted. Glucose and fructose, as mentioned on the earlier slide, as well as galactose and mannose are all monosaccharides. And they all have six carbons, they all have 12 hydrogens, and they all have six oxygens. So let's think about why would there be four different names for molecules that all have this same formula with six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. Well, <laughs> the answer is that these molecules are all isomers of one another. An isomer is a molecule, or isomers, are molecules that have the same chemical formula, all right? So that means they have the same types of atoms, the same uh, number of atoms, but that those atoms are arranged in a different pattern. So same pieces, just built differently. So picture me giving you 24 Legos and me giving somebody else 24 Legos, and all those same Legos were used but built up and connected differently, you know, that's a fair way to think about what an isomer is. Here's uh, glucose and here's fructose. And um, I do want to let you know that fructose is named for fruit sugars. We find fructose a lot in fruit sugars. And fructose can be commonly linked to glucose to form what we call common table sugar, which is sucrose. Right, the stuff that you actually sprinkle out onto your Wheaties to make them taste better, uh, the stuff that you know donuts and really high sugar content candy has a ton of, uh, is sucrose. Sucrose, of course, is what we would refer to as a disaccharide. As stated before, monosaccharides and disaccharides are fairly classified as simple sugars. <coughs> Do you recall what the formula is for a monosaccharide? That's right, it's C6H12O6. So when you link two monosaccharides together, you'd think that there would be two times six carbons, which is 12, two times 12 hydrogens, which is 24, and two times six oxygens, which is 12. So let's think about why this formula for sucrose is C12H22O11. Well, you got to take out two hydrogens and you got to take out one oxygen because when these are linked together, water is made. So if you add up the C6H12O6 and the C6H12O6 and you take away two H's and one O, you get C12H22O11. This bond right here between the first carbon of this glucose and the second carbon of this fructose is referred to as a glycosidic linkage. All right, there's that term, glycosidic linkage. It's a really strong covalent bond that keeps this monosaccharide linked to this monosaccharide. 
taking that same concept further then, we have what we call polysaccharides. These, of course, are going to be the large, more complex carbohydrates. So if you think of complex carbohydrates or complex sugars, as is stated in the, nutri in the nutritional language, those are going to be the big, big, big sugar molecules. Lots and lots and lots and lots of monosaccharides, maybe thousands of monosaccharides. The primary purpose, of course, of the monosaccharides and the disaccharides are going to be energy transfer and energy storage. You eat sugar, you get lots of energy very rapidly, but you might crash. I don't know if you've ever heard of the sugar crash. So if you eat or drink a high sugar content, a simple sugar content um, food or drink, you might feel energetic for a few minutes or maybe an hour or so, and then all of a sudden, a couple hours later, you feel really tired and uh, maybe even lousy again. So, so sometimes athletes will carbo load. Maybe you've heard of carbo loading. You eat pasta or bread. Um, and what you're doing when you're carbo loading, you're eating lots of complex carbohydrates. Namely, you're eating lots of starch. All right? So you're getting lots of sugar, complex polysaccharide sugars, from plant materials. And your body has to work a little bit. And it takes a little bit of time to actually break down this sugar because it's such a big molecule. So in a way, if you carbo-load with large complex sugars, it provides you with energy for a significant period of time and you won't necessarily experience the crash that you would if you are uh, eating or drinking a lot of simple sugars. The other primary function or purpose of large polysaccharide molecules, of course, is structural in nature. So these are materials that are used to build cells or build tissues that cells will build up themselves. <coughs> the energy storage polysaccharides, let's make sure we write this down now. The energy storage polysaccharides, uh, the one for plants, is called starch. This is a photograph uh, using a microscope, right? So we call it a photo uh, micrograph. Um, it is showing you amyloplasts, which are starch grains found within the cell of a plant. This is a photo micrograph or uh, a, microscope, a microscope photograph, a micrograph of animal cells and there's been a stain used here to highlight the glycogen material in red. So starch is the energy storage polysaccharide in plants. Glycogen is the energy storage polysaccharide in animals. Lactose is another disaccharide that you might have heard of. And if you think of the word lactate, that's the process of making milk. And um, it's sort of an odd thing to think about that humans are the only mammals that drink uh, other mammals' milks. Um, and, you know, we drink a lot of cow's milk because the dairy industry tells us it's good for us. But actually, for some of us, it's really not because we don't have the enzyme that breaks down this disaccharide, not all of us do anyway, not all of us have the enzyme that breaks down this disaccharide that's found in dairy material like milk or cheese. Starch of course is a polysaccharide if you eat potatoes, french fries, chips, pasta, bread. Those foods are loaded with starch. If you're a meat eater, uh, if you're a carnivore sometimes, um, you might eat steak or hamburger or chicken or pork chops or something like that. Depending on what you like to eat, understand that when you eat meat, of course you're getting a source of protein there, but within those muscle cells, glycogen will also likely be stored. These are polysaccharides. The structural polysaccharides for plants are um, cellulose molecules. Cellulose is a huge, vast, many, 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 many monosaccharides linked together in long chains as well as cross bridges. The structural polysaccharide in animals we call chitin. And chitin is found in the cuticle or the exoskeleton of insects, arthropods that is, um, uh, which are, um, insects are arthropods and so too are crustaceans. If you look at this diagram here, this is showing you a cellulose molecule, and notice that each individual little hexagon here represents a monosaccharide. 
they're linked together with glycosidic linkages. But there's also cross bridging here. And the greater the amount of cross bridging, the tougher the cellulose material is. And this cross bridging and these glycosidic linkages are really, really, really difficult to break down unless you have the right enzyme in your digestive tract to break it up. Uh, humans don't have that enzyme. And so when we eat salad or other cellulose material, we're getting what the nutritionists call fiber. Um, fiber helps keep us regular and digestively healthy. Although if you eat too much of it, you can feel kind of uh, bloated and stopped up. <coughs> Cows, on the other hand, can digest cellulose, which is why they chew on grass, and that's a good type of nutrition for them. And uh, termites, they can chew on wood because they have the enzyme that can break up the strong cellulose fibers that make the woody tissue, the tough parts of wood, tree trunks, and what have you. Chitin, if you look at this diagram, is a little bit different than cellulose. Uh, we've got chains of monosaccharides here, but the other key thing to look for is that there are these nitrogens. Now, I don't know if you can see this, so I'm going to zoom in here. And I know it gets fuzzy, but that right there is an N. All right. There's another N right there. If you zoom in there, see? And uh, chitin, again, that's the structural polysaccharide found in the uh, exoskeletons of uh, insects and crustaceans, and even in the cell walls of some fungus, like, you know, mushrooms, that is. So, <coughs> for the most part, we also can't eat chitin, um, but some materials, like uh, soft-shell crab chitin exoskeleton, there aren't so many cross-linkages with the proteins um, built in between those nitrogen cross-linkages, so the chitinous material in the exoskeleton of soft-shell crabs is not as tough, so we can chew it up and, and digest that. But if you like eating lobster or shrimp, you know you can't eat the shell. That's just too tough for you to eat. So that'll be the end of our screencast segment three here for carbohydrates. You can look forward to screencast segment four next time. Um, as always, if you have any questions or concern, uh, please talk to Mr. Gales or me, Mr. Workman, if you have any questions. Thanks, everybody.